So tomorrow at 7 p.m. across the street, uh, uh, at Auditorium, we have power of the public for nuclear non proliferation. So this is a panel. Uh, and we have great people, including Frank uh, Fabian, uh, senior uh, spatial information analyst from uh, Los Alamos, James Cornell from uh, uh, Special Technologies uh, uh, Laboratory, Brian Molini, Interim Deputy Director, James Martin Center for non proliferation Studies, and Maya Holiday, Special Assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense at Pentagon. So, 7 o'clock across the street. And uh, we also have um, International Symposium on Radiological Results and Beyond. This is on Friday up at LBL. And we have, um, uh, it's related to Fukushima and long-term effects of low levels of radiation. So we have Mayor of Fukushima coming as well as uh, uh, our colleagues from the University of Tokyo. So you can find it on the website. And now it's my great honor to introduce our speaker for today, Steve Hacker, who is uh, a good friend of our department and helps always when we invite him. Uh, so he will be <laughs> talking about uh, um, how American and Russian nuclear scientists join forces to mitigate some of the greatest post-war war dangers. Um, He's giving this talk for the first time, um, and you are a kind of test audience, so uh, be ready to ask uh, difficult questions. Uh, he's a professor of uh, research uh, in the Department of uh, Management Science and Engineering and a senior fellow at the uh, Freeman Spock Institute for International <coughs> Studies at Stanford University. Uh, he was co-director of Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, CSEC, from 2007 to 2012. He also served as the fifth director of Los Alamos National Laboratory from 86 to 97. Uh, he received uh, uh, his BS, MS, and PhD degrees in metallurgy from Case Western Reserve University. His current uh, professional interests include plutonium research, cooperative nuclear debt reduction with the Russia nuclear complex, global non proliferation, uh, the expansion of nuclear energy, and threats of nuclear terrorism. Uh, he is a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, a member of the Council on uh, Foreign Relations, fellow of the American Physical Society, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for Advanced Science long list. Um, among other awards, we received National Academy of Engineering Arthur uh, M. Bush, whatever is pronunciation award, the American Association for Advanced of Science Award for Science Diplomacy, uh, the Presidential Edith of Fermi Award, the Leo Shearer Prize, the Los Alamos National Laboratory Medal, and so on and so on. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we have extremely distinguished guests to speak here today. So welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I could have looked at what was sent out you know, to shorten it. It's always embarrassing. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I'd like to come over to your department uh, uh, occasionally. Uh, to actually mostly to get caught up on what's going on in the department. So having a chance to talk to people like uh, Peter Hoselman uh, and Ed uh, is, is very enlightening. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Russia. And uh, I've talked about Russia before. So this is not my first Russia talk. But it's my first talk where I try to put everything <coughs> together of sort of the last 25 years of, of working with the Russians. And the reason is that uh, we're almost done uh, with a book on, on Russia. And my colleague, uh, Ala Kasyanova, over here from Stanford, has been helping me out, uh, and especially uh, to really understand uh, uh, Russia uh, and work on the Russian side. So I'm writing a book with two Russian colleagues who were my counterparts when I was director at Los Alamos, mainly the directors of their Los Alamos and, and their Livermore. Uh, we've been working on this for a number of years, and unfortunately, the way things have gone between our governments, we're sort of in a race against time as to whether we're actually going to be able to put this thing out. Uh, but we have lots of fantastic material 
I won't be able to, to do it justice today, but I thought I would at least try to get the essence uh, of the book and the bottom line, uh, and that's what I'm going to tell you. And the bottom line, actually, can, it's doomed to cooperate, and I'm going to explain to you where that comes from. And it is how American and Russian scientists joined forces to mitigate uh, what we thought were some of the greatest post-Cold War dangers, that is, when uh, the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, and so we go back uh, to the days uh, of Reykjavik, because that's when we, things really changed when Gorbachev uh, took over in the Soviet Union in 1985. And actually, in early 1986 is when I became Los Alamos director in January. And by October, we have these two guys, Reagan and Gorbachev, get together in Reykjavik. Uh, and they uh, almost got to the point where they agreed on eliminating nuclear weapons. But it turns out they didn't quite make it uh, for reasons of SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. But they set in motion you know, a whole number of, of events, uh, of events that really changed the Soviet Union and changed the world, and namely Gorbachev's attempt at glasnost, openness, and perestroika, the need to restructure the uh, Soviet uh, system, uh, was the essence. And eventually, things sort of got away from him. Uh, the Baltics became independent, uh, and then uh, East uh, and West Germany united. And that's a picture of the Berlin Wall coming down in November of 1989. Well, it turns out that then, over the next couple of years, there were lots of changes inside of the Soviet Union. And then in August uh, of 1991, there were a number of hardliners that really had thought that Gorbachev had gone too far. They were going to rein him in while Gorbachev was on vacation in the Crimea. Uh, they actually put him under house arrest, took away what we call the nuclear football, or the nuclear briefcase, uh, and put him under house arrest. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, uh, who by that time had become the president of the Russian Federation, uh, actually then managed things in Moscow uh, that made the tanks turn back around. Gorbachev was released, and that's a photo of Gorbachev uh, coming back to Moscow three days later. Here, here are the three hardliners with uh, Gennady Yanayev uh, in charge. So Gorbachev came back, August of 1991, but it was the beginning of the end for Gorbachev. And then the next few months were really instrumental, sort of in the nuclear world. And particularly, and we don't recognize this much now, but the initiative that Presidents George H.W. Bush took then in September, October of 1991, were essential on making sure that at least things didn't come apart right away from a nuclear standpoint uh, in the Soviet Union. And actually, uh, now the conversations have been declassified. He called Mikhail Gorbachev September 27th of 1991. Uh, and essentially, and, and it's interesting to read this transcript, he said, Mikhail, I have these ideas of what I'm going to do, I'm going to take some unilateral measures to take tactical nuclear weapons in the United States sort of out of the stockpile, especially the naval weapons, take the strategic weapons off the instant alert. And I would appreciate if you'd reciprocate, you know, but I will do this unilaterally. Gorbachev said, well, in, in principle, it's a very common Russian term, <laughs> in principle, I, I agree. But well, it turns out on October 5th, Gorbachev went uh, on, on television uh, in Russia, and he said, I have this proposal from President Bush, and here are the steps I'm going to take. And he took reciprocal steps that really lowered that nuclear threshold uh, just enormously. So at a time when the country was beginning to come apart, the Americans actually played the right role by reaching across. So that was the executive action. But not too much later, there was actually, for those of you who know what Track 2 is, that is non-official, non-governmental diplomacy, Track 2 played an enormous role as well uh, in, the late, in late 1991. Particularly, there was uh, a report out of Harvard University. And in fact, it was authored by none other uh, than a guy by the name of Ash Carter, who just became Secretary of Defense uh, now. 
It was called Soviet nuclear fission. And that is pointing out all the things that go, go wrong if the Soviet Union comes apart uh, in terms of the nuclear enterprise. Uh, Bill Perry, who later became Secretary of Defense, was at CSAC uh, at uh, Stanford uh, University, uh, where I am now. And they helped to put together uh, and get the Senate interested in legislation, uh, which then uh, the two gentlemen shown here, uh, Dick Lugar on the left and Sam Nunn on the right, uh, authored this so-called non luga Cooperative Threat Reduction. And, and what's key here is this was a total change you know, from Soviet Union days of Cold Wars. Cooperative Threat Reduction. We're going to work together to reduce the threat that's come from the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, you know, some of you are young enough that that's not in your memory bank. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I just want to remind you as to what actually, what was there. You know, it came apart. Gorbachev finally dissolved it on December 25th, 91. The Commonwealth of Independent States, that is 15 different states, was created uh, out of the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia, then, what was left, experienced these dramatic changes in political, economic system, cultural system. Essentially, everything changed overnight. And the security apparatus that had run so much of the Soviet Union, sort of, for the, it was like throwing a hand grenade into the system. So it took some time uh, to get it to come back together. <clears throat> the government institutions and what I call the Soviet socialistic safety net, and that is even if they never had much money, even if they didn't have enough bread to eat, they knew their kids would be able to go to school and they'd be able to retire. That went away uh, as well. And so as I say here, never before had a nation so fully armed you know, collapsed without war. Its arsenal of tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and huge infrastructure posed the risk. So this was the new risk that replaced the risk of mutual uh, an annihilation. And then more specifically, the things we worried about, you know, so this Soviet complex was a complex of privilege, not of big money, because money in the Soviet Union didn't mean much. What meant something was privilege. They had privilege, and they went from privilege to poverty essentially overnight. So we worried about missiles, warheads, and bombs. We worried about nuclear materials, about nuclear technology export, and this huge infrastructure that we only had spotty information, but whatever information came out uh, was of concern. Uh, these pictures, uh, this is actually, I'll come back to that. It's a photo I took uh, of the guard gate at the former Soviet test site in Semipalatinsk. Uh, now in the uh, nation of Kazakhstan. Nuclear icebreakers, the reason I show these here, because they used highly enriched uranium fuel, which it wouldn't take much chemistry, you know, to change that fuel uh, to uh, nuclear weapons grade uranium. In Ukraine, one of the uh, major research labs, you can see it's pretty run down. So at that point, we were threatened more by Russia's weakness than her strength. And I was there at Los Alamos, working sort of the, the ropes in Washington. And it was so hard to get that concept accepted, as you might imagine, because you know, 40, 47 years of the Cold War, people still believed that whether they were called Soviets or Russians, those are our adversaries. Uh, and yet, the problem was the weakness, the weakness of the state, the ability to control. And so what we, and in fact, if you look now that we were able to peer inside, that complex was enormous. We called it a state within a state. You know, altogether, they probably built more than 100,000 nuclear weapons. Tens of thousands, as I'll tell you in a minute, were still in the arsenal. <coughs> Huge amounts of nuclear materials, you know, hundreds of tons of plutonium somewhere in there. Uh, more than that of highly enriched uranium. Enormous production capacity. You know, some of you know, may know we had a place called Rocky Flats, where we would make the plutonium <coughs> components. Well, they had three of those. Assembly plants, we have a place called Pantex, where we assemble nuclear weapons. They had four of those. Nuclear weapons institutes, well, they had their Los Alamos, their Livermore, and their Sandia, three lab. They all had universities within their cities. Their cities were closed. They were secret. They weren't even on the map of the Soviet Union. They were so secret. Uh, and so it was extensive, extensive civilian power. Uh, and overall, you know, a million people were employed in the nuclear complex, that is both civilian and military, 
And sometimes there wasn't much differentiation between those. So where were those cities? Well, they were all throughout uh, uh, Russia, out into S Siberia, uh, down into what now is, uh, is Kazakhstan, this place uh, at Semipalatinsk, will I come back to later. Uh, Sarov, which is there, Los Alamos, that's where they did design weapons assembly because one of the assembly plants was there uh, and also some plutonium storage. But then the rest uh, of these 10 nuclear cities, Ungarsk was sort of a, an 11th, uh, this is what they did. Lots of employees, lots of residents in those cities, uh, largest concentration of fissile materials, namely highly enriched uranium and plutonium. Uh, they did the nuclear weapons design, they did the plutonium production, pit production, and assembly. So what I'm going to do, is, so, so the book essentially covers these are the major four issues that we saw uh, in, uh, at the time of the dissolution. And I put it in popular terms, you know, loose nukes, loose nuclear materials, loose people, and loose exports. So those are the things we're worried about. What I hope to be able to get across is so what, what did we do together to deal with these issues? And then, you know, where are we now? So just to put in more detail, so in terms of the loose nukes, at that time, when Gorbachev came in, about 85, 86 or so, was the peak of the Russian weapons buildup. And that's about 40,000 nuclear weapons. Now, 40,000, you know, can you imagine that? You know what one weapon did to Hiroshima? Uranium, one weapon did to Nagasaki, one bomb, one city destroyed at 40,000. Nuclear materials, fissile materials, you know, it takes less than 10 kilograms of plutonium to make a bomb. Nagasaki was 6.2 kilograms, you know, a grapefruit, that's it. They had, we're still not sure, you know, somewhere between 100, 150 uh, tons of, of plutonium. Highly enriched uranium, somewhere around 1.2 million kilograms of highly enriched uranium. It takes a few tens of kilograms of highly enriched uranium to make a bomb. So this is a lot of bombs worth of stuff. Loose people, I already mentioned, you know, a million people in their complex. Of course, not all of those associated with weapons, and rather few would have nuclear weapons design information, uh, but still, a huge number of people. And, and the complex was huge, and the country was in economic dire straits. So those were the challenges of, of the time. So what happened in terms of the nukes? The most immediate problem was that actually four of the independent states inherited nuclear weapons. The Ukraine inherited several thousand nuclear weapons. It was actually at that time, uh, Ukraine for a little while was the, had the third largest nuclear uh, arsenal in the world. Uh, and then it was Kazakhstan, and then it was Belarus, in, in addition to Russia. So there were people like Bill Perry, uh, Secretary Perry, and then Ash Carter, who had a major thing to do with actually convincing those countries to give those weapons back uh, to Russia. And indeed, they were brought uh, back to Russia. And, and this was a major accomplishment of this non-Luga uh, program, which paid for all of this. And, and so in fact, in this non-Luga cooperative program, it was focused mostly at infrastructure. It was focused at the missiles, at the bombers, at, at the submarines, uh, and also at the test site, for example, uh, to go ahead and destroy the tunnels of the test site so they could never be used uh, again for nuclear testing. They managed to get some highly enriched uranium uh, out of Kazakhstan, a project called Sapphire. And, and then one of the greatest projects that was actually initiated through a track two, Tom Neff from MIT had this idea that why don't we take, you know, over the years, take 500 metric tons of highly enriched uranium, down blend it to low enriched uranium, feed those into American nuclear reactors, and produce electricity. So today, over the last few years, about 10% uh, of your electricity has been supplied by former Russian highly enriched uranium. The program is now done. Uh, it lasted for about a dozen years or so. 500 metric tons down, blended about $12 billion. Uh, initiated by Tom Neff at MIT, and then of course the governments. My story today is gonna to be mostly about this side, and that is what we call lab to lab. And that is the scientists, to some extent, working in parallel with this government non luga program, to some extent, sort of some overlap, uh, uh, because of course, again, in the end, we needed government money, we needed government blessing and support. 
So that's the story that I'm going to tell. So how did we get started? Well, it was interesting. One of the outcomes uh, of the uh, nuclear, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of the, of the uh, Gorbachev, uh, Reagan, uh, Reykjavik summit uh, was the fact that the two of them agreed that they would take measures to see whether one can ratify a test ban treaty that had been on the books since 1974 called the Threshold Test Ban Treaty, which limited underground nuclear testing uh, to 150 kilotons. And so when I was director at Los Alamos, uh, I got the word that we've got to let the Russians, uh, Soviets still at the time, onto our test site in Nevada. And we had developed some really neat instrumentation that would allow us to give them an on-site presence, allow them to put, essentially, a cable down the hole where we would detonate one of our nuclear devices, and they would be able uh, to measure the yield right there on site, on location. And then at the same time, that would help to calibrate the seismic you know, arrays all over, including the ones in Russia. And then we would flip that, and they would test one of theirs, and we'd put our, what we call cortex, the coax cable, and, and we would do the same thing. And, and lo and behold, in that exercise, it was the first time we really sat you know, right across from our Russian nuclear weapons colleagues. We worked hand in hand for months at a time, and then we did these tests and we got to know each other. One of my colleagues, uh, who now unfortunately is deceased, raising the New Mexico flag above the atomic lake uh, in Semipolitinsk, for instance. All of them sitting here anxiously waiting to see whether the Russian <coughs> test actually went off and was successful, and whether our cortex uh, device actually worked. It, it all worked, and what this did what it first exposed us to each other, and we realized how much like each other we were, rather than how different we were. And that started to build the familiarity, the respect with each other's technical capabilities that then came in very handy. Uh, and in fact, it went from there, from the test sites to Geneva, to finish the negotiations on the Threshold Test Ban Treaty. And Paul Robinson, who used to be at Los Alamos, later on wound up as director of Sandia, uh, was doing the negotiations. And the Russian the Soviet counterpart uh, was Viktor Mikhail, who later became, his technical person, who later became <coughs> the Minister of Atomic Energy. And in one of the stops in Moscow, lo and behold, our guys, our scientists who were there, were invited to come to their nuclear closed cities. Uh, in August of 1990, they went to Snezhensk, or Chelyabinsk 70s for the old hands uh, in here, uh, or it's also called Vinitia, uh, the All-Russian Institute for Technical Physics. Uh, and then in October of 1990, that's where these uh, photos are from. My colleagues from Los Alamos at a banquet in a tent, and then in a the bonfire uh, there in their Los Alamos, Osmos 16, uh, or the city of Sarvo. And during those visits, the Russian scientists had already passed to our guys proposals for working together in scientific areas. And so it was interesting, whereas we like to say, well, we went you know, to try to help those Russians out. It was the Russians that really came across first. And if you think about it, you, you know, the risks that they took, think about the Soviet system for all those years, to actually come out and say, hey, look, we want to work together. Uh, and then, indeed, uh, it turns out, uh, short, this all helped to set up uh, a, um, an exchange visit of laboratory directors. John Knuckles from Lawrence Livermore, a director, and myself from Los Alamos. Uh, we went to their Los Alamos and their Livermore. Uh, in fact, this one is their visit, which came two weeks earlier. This is the, the Russian laser, I'm sorry, to a little more laser facility, uh, and then uh, at Los Alamos. <coughs> so this exchange visit of directors then sort of took this next step uh, as to what it would take for us to work together, to explore to work together. It took a lot to convince the guys in Washington to allow this to happen, but Admiral Watkins, who was Secretary of Energy, uh, gave us the blessing uh, in mid-December of 1991. And so there I was, uh, this is me in the younger days, 
uh, in February of 1992, uh, greeting the guy who is Yuli Borisovich Hariton. He's the guy we call the Russian Oppenheimer. He was 88 at that time. He was the first director of their Los Alamos and then was scientific director essentially for that entire time. Uh, and uh, very interesting stories. Uh, actually, at one point uh, that night at the banquet, he was telling me of where he and Oppenheimer uh, were both at Cambridge at the same time. He was there 1926 to 1928, and Oppenheimer came through for a postdoc. He, he did his PhD uh, at Cambridge uh, at the time. And so we began the program that we call Side by Side as Equals. We thought it was really important for us to be able to get to know each other, work with each other, give them some confidence, and of course also learn from them because they had guys like, uh, like Andrei Sakharov, uh, you know, who invented the tokamak you know, for a fusion reaction. He's the father of the uh, Soviet hydrogen bomb. And he also invented this incredible technique of explosive high compression to create high magnetic fields flux compression that I'll tell you a little bit about. And, and then in computing, it turns out the Russians had computers that didn't even come close to our computing power. Because of that, they learned how to do it smarter. So they were doing parallel computing before we did parallel computing. And so we learned from them how to do parallel. They learned from us as to how to use the big machines. That was the essence of working together. So here we were in Sarov, and it turns out those two towns are as different as Los Alamos and Livermore are. <laughs> Sarov uh, is, this is Saint Seraphim, one of the holiest saints in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, Sarov was his home before uh, the, um, the, uh, the Soviets uh, uh, took over, although he died many years before. Snezhinsk, uh, that's out in the Urals. Uh, Kochatov still stood very tall out in Snezhinsk. What was interesting, and, and this, uh, I made up this view graph, you know, 20 some years ago. I said, what this trip was like is we were welcomed into islands of civility and creativity in those places. You know, at that time, most of the US thought that the Soviet Union was just coming apart. You know, they can't tie their own shoes, their economy is in shambles. But not these people. They were absolutely first class. Uh, and then they also said, you know, Soviet bomb. There are lots of people in the United States would have said, you know, if you were to share things with the Soviets, they wouldn't have done this or that. They said, there's no question there was going to be a Soviet bomb. Uh, and then the scientists, you know, you wonder how people like Sakharov, uh, who in 1968 wrote this incredible essay uh, about civility and, and trying to sort of put chains and brakes on the Soviet nuclear program, how could he have participated and developed the hydrogen bomb? Well, he felt it was his duty, uh, just like the rest of them did. And then the parallels you know, to how they hated each other between their Los Alamos and the Little Moors, just exactly the way Los Alamos and the Little Moors <laughs> hated each other here. Uh, and then this transition you know, from privilege to poverty was an enormous uh, shock. Uh, but as I say here, and I'll come back to that, never underestimate the ability of the Russian people uh, to suffer. Dostoevsky thought, you know, it was one of the beauties of mankind. So, we got started very, very quickly. So by June of 1992, up here, they were already doing preparations for one of these explosive flux compression experiments inside the fence, inside the closed city of Cerro. All Los Alamos scientists were there. Uh, and then in September 93, we actually set off these explosions, fortunately but not nuclear explosions. You know, there's a little bitty high explosive compressing this magnetic flux, creating 10 mega gauss of electric field. Just fantastic scientific work. And this is Steve Younger, who once upon a time was a little more than Los Alamos, being bare hard and lifted off the ground by one of the Russians for the successful experiment. And, and then for me, uh, one of the things that was really great, because people were never sure whether the Cold War was over, uh, and so by 1993, now this was April 1993, so 15, 16 months after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Los Alamos Laboratory, we invited the Russians to come. 
And they did. The scientific directors from their two laboratories came. They were there with the French, with the Brits, with all the big brass from Washington. And we celebrated the 50th anniversary. Uh, and this is Yevgeny Avdorin, who was the scientific director uh, at their Livermore. He presented me uh, with a little memento, uh, which was mounted on serpentine, which is very popular in, in the Urals. On top of it uh, was a, a little miniature rocket actually from a piece of an SS-11 rocket that used to be pointed at the United States. That's what he gave me for our 50th anniversary present. <laughs> so if that doesn't blow your mind, the inscription on the serpentine will really blow your mind. <laughs> from Russia with love. This was 1993. By the way, we don't get much from Russia with love today. You know? <laughs> in 1993, this is what already happened. So you can imagine how that paved the way for our scientists working together. So why? You know, why did they want to do this so shortly after the breakup of the Soviet Union? You'd expect that we'd be adversaries. And this is where the quote came from. So I was interviewing, and actually Allah was there with me, uh, with one of the key persons in, in the Russian uh, nuclear program, uh, Lev Ryabev. Uh, and this was uh, just about a year ago. And I asked him this question, so why, what made you reach across so quickly and, and, and so early? And he said, you know, we realized that just building more and more bombs, this is the 50, this uh, bomb, this is Yuri Trutnev, who's the co-designer of what's called the Tsar Bomba. And it was tested at 50 megatons. 50 megatons uh, up uh, in Novaya Zemlya uh, by the Earth Circle. Uh, this was the actual explosion. The, the bomb was designed altogether for 100 megatons. Sakharov convinced them to test it at half yield. And, and so Ryabev said, you know, we were going in that direction of more and more bombs, more and more. We knew that that wasn't going to get anywhere, and there had to be some breaks, some cooperation. But then he said, what really convinced us uh, is um, Chernobyl. And Chernobyl really concerned them. And they said, we knew that our nuclear weapon safety was different than the nuclear reactor people. It, it was different, but we were concerned. And we wanted to know, how do others do it? He said, Chernobyl happened because the Soviet Union was isolated. He said, in his words, we were doomed to cooperate. And that's why we reached across so quickly. By the way, this uh, it, here it is uh, space nuclear uh, RTG, radioisotopic uh, thermoelectric generator, using 238 for the good things, because the Russians also believe you must use nuclear energy for nuclear energy to, to power uh, the country and for everything else. In addition, what they also explained, they said, look, our heritage goes back to the same places the great schools of European physics. You know, whether you're talking about a Kapitza, or whether you're talking uh, about a J. Robert Oppenheimer, and then of course you have the, you have the Fermis, the Tellers, the Wigmans, you know, the von Neumanns, they all go back, they were all there uh, in the few great schools uh, of physics. So this was essentially, <coughs> the, the Russian nuclear program sort of kept an island of civility, uh, even within that communist system. And these guys knew it, and this gave them a chance. What Harikon said to us when we arrived is, I've been waiting 40 years for this. Because before the contacts were turned off, the, the Soviets were part of the international, particularly physics community. OK, so then in terms of, of cooperative nuclear threat reduction, so what are the things that we've done? And I mentioned the weapons, materials, workers, infrastructure, uh, working together against nuclear terrorism, issues of nuclear energy, environmental, and scientific research. And we had this enormous spirit of cooperation. So I'm going to walk you through this uh, very quickly because I spend a little more time on the front end than I expected. So on these four issues. So loose nukes. First program started already right in late 1991, even before the Soviet Union was dissolved. How the Russians actually said, look, we need help. We're going to have all these weapons coming back you know, from uh, Eastern Europe and then eventually from the other states of the former Soviet Union. We've never disassembled that many weapons you know, in that short a time. 
We need to make sure we can transport them safely, we can disassemble them safely, that we can store them safely, or store the materials safely. And so because of President Bush, because of Nanluga, then the lab people were brought in uh, to help them with that. Then eventually that turned into a program which is one of the most tremendous programs of looking at nuclear security issues, what we call WISICs, or Warhead Safety and Security Exchange. So the safe, secure uh, dismantlement, Sandia National Laboratories played a particularly big role. And, and as I say here, they'll quickly provide equipment to enhance Russian nuclear weapon transportation, storage, safety, accident response. What they're looking here is at Kevlar blankets. So actually things like providing Kevlar blankets for the weapons as they're transported back. So if someone tries to attack them, you know that they don't go off. And so very, very quick progress. Uh, this is from one of the papers uh, uh, by Radi Elkayev, who is my counterpart and also co-author, to show what was done in the nuclear weapons safety and security arena from the years of about 1995 to 2005. So we looked at safety and security systems, security norms and regulations. How do you, ha how do you handle the security and, and safety regulations? Transportation, storage. The emergency effects on, on, on warheads. Uh, and so I, I'll let you uh, read the rest of the list. But in that cooperation, it, well, of course, we never exchanged classified information because the two countries had no mechanism to do that. But these were incredibly sensitive issues, and we were able to work on these sensitive issues. We each knew what our classification guidelines were. We knew how far we could go. But for example, it got down to at one point uh, where the Russians were saying, look, you know, we've got these warheads, and we, sometimes we have this really stubborn explosive. You know, it sticks you know, to the rest of the components inside of the weapon, and we're having a heck of a time getting it a, a, you know, apart mechanically. And one of the chemists from Livermore said, oh, oh we've got that salt, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxy. <laughs> That's what you do, and you just dissolve it. And they said, you've given us a gift from heaven. Because <laughs> <laughs> it worked. That's the sort of cooperation. There's no government, there's no government diplomatic thing that you could do. You can only do that if you get the scientists working next to each other, sharing the problems, the issues, the difficulties. Uh, and uh, it, it was just uh, uh, really superb. Now, what actually turned out is, is that President Clinton, uh, let's see. I'll, I think I'll say that in a minute. So then we also work on a special system, lots of instrumentation. You've got instrumentation uh, people uh, here, the so-called TOBOS, which stands for a Russian acronym. Uh, in essence, they have an, an automated monitoring and inspection system that is able to look at all aspects of storage, uh, of transportation, uh, you know, rail, truck, and everywhere else. They have automated feedback and be able to inspect and monitor these things without actually having to go there and do a hands-on inventory. Sandia worked this hand-in-hand -hand with the Russian Sandia, which is called Vinyat, the Institute of Automatics. And they developed the system, uh, which was fielded then in Russia, and also the feedback uh, helped us uh, on the United States. Uh, in fact, I, I, I didn't have it here, so let me go back. Uh, on the Swissix arrangement, it turns out President Clinton actually gave that an additional boost uh, in 1995, he wrote one of the presidential decision directives. It's what's called PDD 47, where he actually said that we should help the Russians make sure that they can take care of their own nuclear stockpile, that their safety, security, and reliability was important for the United States. And we ought to work together, particularly in the spirit of the fact that Clinton wanted the uh, comprehensive test ban treaty signed. Uh, that uh, document has now been declassified. Uh, in nuclear materials, uh, this is particularly uh, where I, I was involved to a large extent uh, with the Russians. Uh, this uh, country paid over $400 million to have the Russians build the most modern uh, nuclear material storage facility in the world at a place called Mayak. Uh, the technical people had a part uh, in uh, things like the Los Alamos people working with their Los Alamos uh, people doing a thermal calculation as to how many canisters can you really put in there. And you know, what are the problems associated with that from a heat loading standpoint, from a radiation standpoint? 
but it was a reasonably minor role. The biggest role we had in, in this thing called MPCNA, which I'll uh, describe in a minute. But then also the Russians, just like the Americans, stopped production of fissile materials for bombs. Uh, fissile materials recovery, some of that still goes on today, bringing back highly enriched uranium from reactors around the world. And then I'm going to describe for you one of my favorite projects, which is <coughs> trying to deal with one of their former sites, namely the test site in Kazakhstan. And then there's a program called Second Line of Defense. Again, the scientists play a large role. But the scientists played the primary role in, in getting this program started. And, and particularly, uh, I went uh, to Russia. Uh, I went to their Los Alamos and, and their Livermore uh, and tried to assess how are they doing the nuclear material security and safeguards. And in essence, it was the old Soviet style, which is mostly physical security. We called it guns, guards, and gulags. And, and in this country, you know, that gulags don't work. And, and so we had to have other means of having technology to back up the physical protection and the human reliability programs to worry about insider threat, not just about outs outsider. So we worked very closely, and I was able in 1994 to convince Charles Curtis, who at that time was under Secretary of Energy, to actually allow me to go to Russia, and I did, and I signed the first three contracts for cooperation on nuclear material security with the Russians. Uh, VNEF, uh, their Los Alamos, their Livermore, and then Kochatov Institute, which was a, by that time was a civilian institute but had uh, nuclear materials. We did that in 1994. Uh, just to give you an idea, b before, the Russians never had these things where they worried about uh, actually having you know, metal detectors, radiation detectors, having material balance areas, having gamma spectrometers in there, neutron counters, putting all of that together to make sure that you can control you know, and account for the nuclear materials. They just, you put the guards on the outside and you don't worry what goes on in the inside. So they were developing this. And the Russians, they had no problem doing this. There was no problem with the technology. They knew how to do this, but they never had to. They didn't have the money, and before, they didn't have the incentive. So we provided both the money and the incentive. And, and this program, it just terminated last December. Over the 20 years, uh, this country spent $4 billion actually working with the Russians to provide the safeguarding and the security of their nuclear materials. I know you can't read that, but don't worry about it. By 1998, we already had 40 Russian sites, hundreds of buildings that had benefited by this material security. That was one of the greatest single threats. You know, for example, up in the northern sites near Murmansk, uh, of the fact that they had fresh reactor fuel, highly enriched uranium, by that time essentially unguarded in the early 1990s. Uh, so lots of cooperative work. So the reason it was so important is because keeping these materials out of the hands of terrorists you know, really is important. And it is much more difficult than the diplomats appreciate. And uh, you, know, you being here in nuclear engineering, you know, there's lots of it. I showed you how much. Many locations, <coughs> many different forms, uh, difficult to handle and count. And here's secrecy then doesn't allow your superiors to check whether you're actually doing your job down below. Uh, so there are a lot of Americans who said, why can't they just lock down their nuclear materials, like Fort Knox or Kremlin, the, um, uh, the treasures in the armory in the Kremlin? Well, it's not that easy. OK, a little story on semi Palatinsk nuclear test site. So this is a huge, huge place out now in the country of Kazakhstan. You know, some 450 some nuclear tests occurred there. Uh, and of course, uh, they occurred uh, both in the atmosphere, in tunnels, and some in boreholes. But, and, and uh, the American government, through the Threat Reduction uh, Agency, uh, actually helped to close many of those tunnels. Uh, I went to my Russian colleagues uh, because of what I know, what we did in the United States, and said, hey, look, did you do some of these tests, the equation of state tests, and what we call hydronuclear experiments? Well, you don't blow up you know, the, the fissile materials. You just might shock them a little and break them up or whatever. Did you guys do those kind of tests you know, out in Semipalatinsk? And what did you believe behind, uh, leave behind? And, and my colleagues said, we're not going back to Semipalatinsk. Yeah. 
Uh, they just want reparations from us for all the environmental damage that's presumed to be out there. So I went to Kazakhstan by myself. Uh, and uh, oops, let me actually skip forward to this. And this is what I found. That's the guard gate that I already showed you. That was much scarier than the guard gate. And one of the Kazakhs, uh, the head of their Institute of Nuclear Physics, who came to visit me in late 97, told me about the fact that out there, we can't control this area, he said. It's a huge area. It, it was a nomadic area. And there are metal scavengers out there that are pulling the copper cables out from nuclear testing and selling them you know, all around, including to the Chinese. So I expected to find guys on camels, you know, pulling on top of the <laughs> Instead, I found kilometer after kilometer of these trenches. So somebody was in there with very modern equipment. And I was concerned, what's at the end of one of these trenches? So I went back to my colleagues. Uh, and uh, they started working with us in 19, uh, late 1988. And for about 15 years, we ran this program uh, that actually somebody, they, you know, managed through these various cables that uh, occasionally, you know, get leaked out. And, and this was in the Spiegel uh, online, saying that a U.S. cable, you know, from Kazakhstan, somebody in Kazakhstan said plutonium is lying around, virtually unprotected at this test site, where the Soviets once detonated 500 nuclear bombs. Could this dangerous material fall into the hands of the terrorists? So that's what we went after. We couldn't do it without the Russians. We couldn't have done it without having the scientific respect and trust we had in, in each other. The Russians came out there with us. We judged whether that problem might be a proliferation problem, an environmental problem. And then the Kazakhs did the actual remediation, you know, whatever that happened to be. And one of the uh, papers in my book is from this Viktor Stepanyuk, who tells the whole story of this 15-year effort of how we worked together. And he says it, you know, in collaboration, we sort of prevented the unauthorized non-industrial extraction, which means non, uh, not by a weapons power, of about 100 kilograms of weapons-grade plutonium material all over the place. So what happened, uh, and I, I want to give you uh, uh, the gist of it, uh, there were equation of state tests uh, down here. A couple of meters down, a little piece of plutonium, explosively loaded, measure what happens on the <coughs> other end. And then they left it there, you know, because they did not expect this test site to go to a different country sometime in the future. <laughs> so it was still there. The Russians told us where it was. We tried to decide, do we get it out of there? Do we do it? So we built together with Kazakhs and Russians this sarcophagus and essentially shows. So this stuff is in place, but I don't worry about it anymore. They did some things in Kolbas, for those of you who know Russian, that's sort of a flask, and uh, they are these experimental containers. So they blew up plutonium and highly enriched uranium and then left it in there, because these things are big and heavy. So we figured out ways how to, as the Russians would say, liquidate the Kolbas. So this was an incredible, you know, a 14, 15 year effort of three countries working together, scientists, technical people, taking care of a problem that probably was close to one of the the you know, most crucial potential terrorist problems we had. OK, nuclear uh, people and, and brain drain. So that's what we called it. And actually, that, that's what, uh, why Admiral Watkins allowed me to go to the Russian nuclear labs, because President Bush the first said, we're worried about the brain drain. And the issue was, you got all these nuclear you know, brains in, in, in Soviet Union. It falls apart. Will they go someplace else? Uh, you know, at that time, actually, Iraq was number one on the list, but Iran, North Korea, and so forth. Uh, so uh, the way we thought we could do this, we'd work with them on problems that they thought were of interest, so scientific cooperation. State Department set up this thing called the ISTC, International Science and Technology Center. Uh, we had another initiative that was congressionally initiated, actually, by uh, Senator Domenici from New Mexico. Uh, called Initiatives for Proliferation Prevention, trying to get the Russian scientists and engineers to do civilian commercial related activity. Similar for the cities themselves was called Nuclear Cities Initiative. The, the bottom line is essentially, as I'll tell you later, uh, the Russians never thought they had a real brain drain problem. 
they were concerned about their people and praying their people, but they did not think their people were going to go to Iraq. And indeed, here's one of those flux compression experiments that we did very early on uh, that I mentioned. And it was, a, it was a terrific way to engage the Russians in something that was interesting to them. It gave them hope that whereas the Russian government you know, was decreasing all of its funds, some of these people, when I went there, and by the way, my first visit was February. I've been there 49 times uh, in the last 20-some years. So and some of the times when I went in the 90s, 98 was the worst. You know, you'd ask them, and you know, when did you get paid last? Not for six months. You know, so there were times when they didn't get paid. They managed to live on credit you know, at the local grocery store. They hung in there. This gave them hope. That's the flux compression uh, idea. Again, it was initially the idea of Sakharov. And he had uh, uh, several, several uh, very able disciples. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I think I talked about this out here once before, uh, is so I did plutonium metallurgy. Uh, and uh, we had disagreed with, uh, on the phase diagram of plutonium gallium for 40 years. Uh, and uh, I heard their version in 1975 in baden baden Germany. That's their version that this delta phase, which is phase in a cubic phase, actually is not thermodynamically stable. It will uh, undergo what you took with uh, decomposition and separate into alpha and PU3G. Uh, we in the United States believe that the delta phase is stable down to room temperature. And so we make our bombs out of delta phase plutonium. It's going to stick around forever. If this is really true, the bombs may not stick around forever if they decompose. So uh, I finally met uh, the woman who well, turns out is their preeminent uh, plutonium metallurgist. We worked together for two years trying to figure out our differences. And the bottom, is, bottom line is they were right. Uh, so theirs is the thermodynamic equilibrium phase diagram. Ours, though, is kinetically OK, because it turns out the kinetics can never get you there. <laughs> you know, it would take probably 10,000 years for this stuff to decompose at room temperature. Uh, and so for all intents and purposes, we thought our bombs were OK. But you start to worry a little bit when you think about radiation damage. Anyway, that's another story. But we dealt with this idea of having, using their skills to do other things. Uh, from medical equipment uh, here, we did the scientific collaboration, open computing center uh, to say, look, if, if in India, if they can, you know, we can outsource all this uh, sort of software development to India, these guys are really well trained. Their mathematics department at Vinia, their Los Alamos, 1,400 people. 1,400 people. Fantastic mathematicians. Uh, and uh, so we helped them. We established a, a center outside. There's a long story associated with that that will also be in the book. But what about the people in stockpile stewardship, so taking care uh, of the bombs? So we were concerned about brain drain. What they were concerned about it is how do you keep the people to make sure to keep the nuclear weapons safe, secure, and reliable? You know, and so this is a cartoon that uh, Radio Kayev showed one day. And yesterday, he said, we had everything. We blew up the bombs. We had the bombs. We had lasers. We had computers. Everything. You know, today, this was 1998, 99. You know, the old man has to explain to the youngster uh, that, hey, look at this. This is the way it is. And then tomorrow, you know, youngster going to be scratching his head. The old man's picture is on the wall. There's no more testing. You know, the lasers are there, but he doesn't quite know what to do. And so that's the same way we do in stockpile stewardship. <laughs> <laughs> so loose, next, uh, nu uh, loose nuclear exports, I won't spend much time on that. We were very concerned that, you know, if the country and the individuals are economically stressed to the limit, uh, will they actually export? Uh, and it turns out in Iran, uh, the Russians actually did some really questionable things in the 1990s. In fact, Viktor Mikhailov, who uh, a lot of Americans think he was one of the ogres uh, uh, of the Russian nuclear program. To me, he was one of the heroes. Uh, because he was indeed, he wrote a book called The Hawk, I'm a Hawk. He was a hawk. And nobody doubted his patriotism. And so he was able to give the imprimatur to the scientists to work together. And anyway, he signed a secret document with the Iranians 
1995 the, the supplying with enrichment capabilities. He never went through with that, and the American the Clinton administration was constantly on Russia to not help the Iranians. So in the 2000s, the Russians went in the right direction. They built, they finished this Bushehr uh, nuclear power reactor, essentially you know, 900 megawatt uh, light water reactor. Uh, and they're supplying the fuel. They can take back the spent fuel. So that's sort of the best th that it gets uh, in the nuclear uh, world. Uh, and then uh, they've been very instrumental in, in the Iran negotiations. Uh, they've put in export control uh, laws and regulations. Uh, scientists work together. And I would say overall they have respectable record. And, and I would say, you know, this is Lavrov, Minister Lavrov right here. Without the Russians, I don't think we would have had a, an Iranian deal, for example. So now to sort of wrap this up, before I get into a little bit of uh, philosophy at the end, um, so what happened over all these years? And again, th this is pretty simplistic. Uh, but loose nukes, there weren't any. Okay. Loose fissile materials, well, there was some leakage in 1993, 94 was sort of the worst. Uh, maybe sub-kilogram quantities of plutonium some German sting operations uh, managed to get some of that. Uh, 2008 in, in, in Georgia, some guy with a plastic bag full uh, of uh, uranium oxide uh, over the hills. Uh, but for the most part, you know, for having 1.4 million kilograms of this stuff, essentially nothing. And then particularly nothing has come back to haunt us that we know. Of course, we don't know what got away, you know, that we don't know. But the fact that it hasn't come back in the form of a bomb is somewhat encouraging. So very, very little leakage. This I would have never predicted in 1992 when you looked at their contacts. The people, essentially no brain drain. Uh, there's a guy by the name Danilov you know, who worked for Snezhensk at, at, at C-70 that presumably did some calculations with the Iranian related to explosives. Nobody knows exactly for sure. But again, very, very low when you think about the challenge. And then nuclear export, uh, I would say, you know, no major problems. So that's a pretty good record. And then you ask, so why? Well, a lot of what you hear in the United States about cooperative threat reduction, and generally with people, we Americans, we save those guys. You know, $12 billion all the way around in, in cooperative threat reduction that was invested, $4 billion in this area of materials alone. Well, it turns out we, we didn't say them. You know, to me, the biggest heroes are the Russian nuclear workers and their military counterparts. I mean, they really are professional, patriotic, dedicated, responsible, not only responsible for Russia, but they feel a global responsibility. So these guys in the nuclear weapons program, they're cut from a different cloth. I mean, they really are remarkable people. And it's only through working with them for all these years uh, that um, we'll be able to make a convincing case. And they were willing to endure hardship. Uh, certainly, the US government took some really key steps. George H.W. Bush someday will get appropriate recognition for what he did with these initiatives. Nan Lugar, uh, they, without them, we wouldn't have had the money. We wouldn't have the overall blessing. It was key. Clinton's PD-47 gave us the extra edge. And then for me, Under Secretary Charles Curtis at DOE, He's the guy that really, in 1994, that supported us, the scientists, to go and work with the Russians. He had the trust in us. And then I would say that we, the US scientific community, we stepped in just in time. They needed us, not so much for our money. They told me right in the beginning, don't spoil us. We don't, we don't really need your money. It helps. What we really need is engagement. We need you uh, to work with us, and, and we did. So what we learned, the scientific cooperation, you know, mutual respect from respect, then common interest comes trust. Treat each other as equals. That's not what all the Americans program did. You know, they said, this is our money, you're going to do what we want you to do. We treat them as equal, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. <coughs> Engage them in identifying the problems. Step by step, start small, but produce. You know, focus on quick actions. We convince our government, they convince theirs. That's, that's hard work. Then we all said, don't let the bureaucrats win. Because for the bureaucrats, there's nothing in success. It's just they want to make sure nothing goes wrong. We had lots of things that could have gone wrong. And we really shared the same sense of responsibility. 
Because then I have another few minutes to finish sort of bringing it into. So if yeah, for, for those of you wants to leave, it's time. Right yeah. now it's five o'clock, but yes. I mean, I said, well, you know, certainly one of the Q's and A's, but, but I just I want to bring it up in, into today's world, you know, because we have all of this news about Russia, what Putin is doing, what's happening in the Ukraine, what's happening in Crimea. Uh, so, 1992, we were threatened more by Russia's weakness. Putin, it's 2012 already, but he certainly says it again today, and he was just back in Sarov last year. That he says we should not tempt anyone by allowing ourselves to be weak. We've got a big country, we cannot afford to be weak. And so therefore, nuclear weapons today you know, are as important as they've ever been and perhaps more important. And, and so the Russians have spelled out a nuclear weapons strategy and, you know, where they have the big weapons, strategic deterrent, the tactical weapons uh, for a regional uh, deterrent. And they believe those nuclear weapons are absolutely essential to protect them from the fact that they really are concerned about the weakness. I think Putin is concerned about the weakness, whether it's NATO expansion, what's going on in the Ukraine. And that plays up, uh, indeed, to bring us the difficulties that we have today. This is a photo I took when I was there a year ago. I uh, translate the uh, Russian, you know, Crimea and Russia together forever. It's almost universal across Russia. No matter what citizens you see, they believe Crimea and Russia are together forever. Now, does this man look like he's going to deal with us, or that he might be concerned about weakness? Uh, doesn't look like it. There's Eastern Ukraine. This is where the political situation was even a couple of years ago, and that's where we stand today. <laughs> Doesn't look like much hope in terms of diplomatic dialogue, and things have gone uh, downhill. However, here's my counterpart, and you can see we have a little different <laughs> relationship <laughs> with each other uh, than that relationship. <laughs> so I think we're still doomed to cooperate uh, today, uh, and of course, it's become so much more complicated now for these different reasons. To me, it makes no sense whatsoever for Russia and the United States to worry about you know, being adversaries. But nevertheless, we're there. For whatever reason, Russia feels, at this point, it feels threatened. And it's taken actions uh, which have moved it away from this cooperation. And so in spite of the fact that I told you, you know, I'm not worried about loose nukes, I feel much better about nuclear materials, uh, and nuclear exports and things, it's if they go back to isolation, and that's where they're going now. They are going towards isolation. We're pushing them towards isolation. You know, our governments uh, right now, uh, uh, it says that we will not work with the Russians in areas of nuclear energy, for example, or scientific collaboration. We'll work with them on security. Those are the things that get you away from cooperation or isolation. And I maintain, in the nuclear arena, whether it's bombs, whether it's nuclear energy, you need cooperation. Isolation leads to disasters. And so somehow we hope, and we hope that our book will at least show that, look, you could work together for all of those years, and you could actually tackle some of the most serious problems through cooperation. So with that, I stop, and I thank you for your pleasure. presentation, a lot of data, and I think a lot of questions, so let's see, Bob. Sig, you didn't talk about whether there were any key people in the Russian weapons complex who were opposed to this, who had to be overridden by the others, and I, I'm saying that because I was involved in that period in the small group of people that were working with the Soviets and then the Russians on the nuclear reactor side. And there were about six or eight key people, and about half of them were bitterly opposed to any cooperation with us as an insult to Mother Russia. They just felt that they uh, didn't want to, because they didn't want to be told 
And it took, therefore, about a decade or even 15 years. It was probably in the middle of the 2000s before that generation passed along the baton to people who were more willing. So during, I'm which the time, during, during which time, we say we got a lot of cooperation from everybody else. The Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, the Armenians, who were, used to be Soviets, and all those countries like the Hungarians and so on that were, but not for the Russians themselves for 15 more years because of that was. You must have so not had that. So a very good question, and it was totally different than a weapon yeah. It was instant cooperation from essentially all the key people right. through. The, uh, in 92, 93, 94, their security apparatus was significantly weakened you know, because of the dissolution of the change from Soviet Union to Russia. That helped us significantly. So the security apparatus wasn't there to just keep saying no. And then essentially everybody from Mikhailov down to Ryabev, they were the two key people. And then the directors uh, at these places uh, were just enormously supportive and they actually reached out more than we reached in to begin with. So it, it was superb. By the mid-1990s, when we were doing the first MPCMA work, what actually got us all over the hump, because I, I didn't tell the whole story, but the government also was going to start MPCMA, yeah. government to government. The American government went there and said, look, we know your material isn't well protected. Let us help you. What do you expect the Russian government to say? No, they said, no, no, thank you. Our material isn't well protected. Well, I went there and I saw it wasn't well protected. So we worked, they worked on their side. 95, 6, 7, their security people is what made that effective. We involved them up yeah. front. So we got them involved. All of that lasted until about 2000, 2001. And then what happened is exactly the opposite from here. Then you got more and more naysayers. And so the last few years, not just now because of Ukraine and Crimea, but I would say the last five years or so, the, the security apparatus and the suspicions of us have increased significantly. And so you, you know, I, mean, I, I, I go there and the security people will say, we know you're a spy. You know, so it's very unfortunate that it's gone that way. The scientists of the corporation said. So it was different. Okay, let's see. Your students? Yeah. Any questions? Shy? Okay, Jay. Uh, in this morning's Wall Street Journal, they reported that uh, Russia threatened the Danish fleet that they would nuke. They didn't oh, uh, <laughs> uh, stop doing something that they were doing in the mall or something like that. Which was uh, for the Fox News. So was it Fox News? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fox News. Okay, okay. Fair <laughs> okay. No, no, but if, if it's true, it's, a, uh, it's an entirely different attitude towards the use of nuclear weapons that existed throughout the Cold War. Throughout the Cold War, nuclear weapons were considered to be defensive. Now they're being used as a potentially offensive weapon. This is a major change. So I, I, I do not believe that change is real. I, I do not believe that's the Russian government's uh, policy as such. Uh, they certainly, uh, without doubt, make sure that we understand that they have a full spectrum of return. Yeah. That they're able to take care of everything and the more ballistic missile capabilities, the defense capabilities that we build, <coughs> the more they will figure out how to get around those. They're gonna keep their nuclear weapon uh, you know, inventory viable and the deterrent up. No question about that, Putin has made that clear. Uh, on the other hand, I do not believe that they've changed their policy and strategy vis-a-vis -vis of using these weapons as a deterrent. They just view them now as a grander deterrent, and, you know, so that nobody will mess with Russia, and perhaps on the Danish they'll do anything that they don't like. And, and that they will do anything that they don't like. My own view is, but it's still there as a deterrent. So, but it also shows that Russia has gone more in the direction of the United States. You know, last week, John Bolton, you know, published an op-ed piece that says, you know, Iran, there's only one solution. You got to nuke them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm sorry. You got to bomb them. Bomb them. <laughs> uh, but, he, but he said bomb them. 
Like with both, not with you will love. <laughs> so you, you can't believe everything that you hear. Yes. Um, were there any official Russian policies that have been implemented since the cooling of US Russia relations that have specifically prevented scientists from um, working together, or vice versa? Or has it just been kind of a. I'm sorry, the official? Have there, have there been any like uh, explicit policies preventing? Uh, scientists from working together, or you know, degrading oh, the quality yeah, of cooperation. Sure. So, how uh, is that? The, the so, so first of all, the the Russian uh, nuclear weapon scientists now, uh, most of them cannot travel outside of Russia anymore. And, and when I talk to my colleague uh, about, uh, so how are things going? So first of all, he'll admit it's better in their labs than it's been since 1985. They're able to recruit bright young people, but their biggest problem is that those young people are told that they will not be able to travel abroad at all. And so Yokayev says that is a major, major problem for them. And so that's, that's limiting their recruiting, because in today's world, that just doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, in terms of cooperation, uh, yes, they're, they're much more restricted than they were in the past. Uh, however, our government is doing exactly the same thing. The Los Alamos scientists, Livermore scientists, were just invited to go to an annual conference in Zarov, uh, and they were not allowed to go by our government. They got, they got an invitation from the Russians. They were not allowed to go. I'm trying to get the Russians to come to a plutonium conference, and of course the Russians said, look, you, know, you don't come, uh, we don't come. So I would say in that area, that uh, our government is also they made this decision to try to isolate the Russians, including in science, but try to keep them on the tether in security. But the Russians are smart enough. You know, they're willing to do security, but not security without the rest. And so I'm afraid that is a major problem, but it's one that we both uh, are responsible for. Does that influence the culture of the scientists at all, or are the scientists kind of like, oh gosh, our politicians, here we go again? <laughs> So uh, you're saying, what's the reaction of the scientists? Yeah, or does, do the attitudes of the scientists change to adopt the policies of their oh, oh. countries? Or? Uh, so I, I, I would say, in terms of our cooperation, I've not seen that policy change. I would say that they're more cautious today. But still say this cooperation is, is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, however, when we discuss Crimea, <laughs> They defend Russia and the actions in Crimea. And so over dinner a year ago, you know, with my good colleague who did the plutonium phase diagram, you know, she's telling me that I've been brainwashed <laughs> by the Western media. And so I finally had to say, okay, look, we can't agree on Crimea. Now let's do these more difficult things like plutonium. <laughs> so if I may, change the subject briefly. So you're an expert on uh, uh, many of these non-proliferation issues. What's going on? Or what's your brief commentary on the uh, recent uh, agreements with the Iranians? So I, I, I did an interview with the Russian press and one with the Iranian press <laughs> <laughs> on that. And, and, and if you look in the bulletin of the Atomic Scientists this week, they carry a debate on the Iran. And they asked me to write a piece, and I wrote a 500-word piece. The essence of it is that in my opinion, it's a step in the right direction. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, first of all, the deal isn't done. Uh, they were able, the US government, namely John Kerry, and one of the best things about that whole negotiation, by the way, if you look at, at many of the photos that have been shown, there's a guy sitting next to John Kerry who looks a lot like Secretary Ernie Moniz. <laughs> <laughs> the only secretary, and it is. So Kerry had a card-carrying scientist next to him, and they were able to pull off much greater restrictions on the Iranian nuclear program than I had hoped. It turns out I met with this minister Tsarif a year and a half ago, and we discussed the reactor, we discussed enrichment. I never thought we could get as far as they did. But then having said that, the counting the centrifuges, counting the, the amount of LAU, to me that's not the major issue. But these guys have the ability to build a bomb if they want to build it. They can break out, sneak out, do whatever. They can build a bomb. 
the real issue is how do you convince them that that is not in their best interest? That they have more to lose by doing that than to gain. That's what we should be focusing on and it's going to take years for that. So they're going to keep a hedge and during that time what you hope to do is the same as here, integrate, cooperate. So I, I had actually suggested that this Iraq reactor they, they actually make it an international research user facility in Taiwan. Uh, that, oh, it's a little uh, uh, south of Taiwan. That brings scientists in to use that reactor to do research. Ernie Moniz apparently convinced them to take the Fordo deeply sunk in Richmond site and turn it into an international scientific research place. If that happens, and if they get another one or two Russian power reactors, they'll have enough on the line that it, it's not going to make sense to break out of, in, in the bomb arena. So, so having said that, though, what, what I think, though, the nuclear problem is only one small problem of this much bigger political problem of Iran and the Middle East and what's going to happen. And eventually, that's going to have to be solved. But fortunately, as I like to say, I'm just a scientist. You know, I don't do that one. Question. Uh, I noticed the, the picture at the beginning of was Gorbachev and Reagan. Okay? And I know that uh, John Paul II had a big impact on peace and, and the break of the Soviet Union. And when I'm thinking with Iran, uh, if peace is the eventual goal, uh, Pope Francis now has initiated that same message. Do you think that will have an impact on? people coming together in a peaceful environment to avoid that same reoccurrence? Well, that, that's it. I, I don't know the, the answer to that. It, it certainly cannot hurt. Um, but in the spirit, even without the Pope, uh, one of the most encouraging things uh, is uh, Iran has hardliners, just like we have hardliners. They have people who want to kill the deal. We have people you know, 47 senators, for heaven's sakes, you know, sign this stupid letter uh, to tell them that, you know, you may not be able to get it through. So they have hardliners. And Sarif had told me personally, he was concerned about the hardliners that if he brings home a deal. That there's a picture in the Washington Post on, on Friday that shows, shows Sarif getting out of a car uh, at the airport in, uh, in uh, of the Belief from the airport in, in Tehran. And he's got hundreds and hundreds of onlookers cheering him on for the fact that he was able to pull this off. So right now, he appears for the most part to be a hero uh, in Tehran. That's really good news. So if the Pope can help that, you know, and the people in Iran in the end. I, I've also, if you look a year ago, January, I wrote a piece with my ex-speaker, the Iranian colleague, Amos Milani, about Iran and, and what they might consider doing. We called it a nuclear program that will benefit the Iranian people. And it's critical of the path that they've taken. It essentially says, look, you don't need enrichment, not because we don't allow you to, but it doesn't make economic sense. You don't need reprocessing. You don't have enough reactors to make reprocessing worthwhile. So you can buy the fuel. You can have the fuel enriched. Just build reactors and run the reactors. You know, that will be the benefit uh, of your people in Iran. It was quite critical. The, the part I want to tell you is the Iranian Ministry of Culture translated that article into Farsi and posted it on its website. That's remarkable. So Iran's a different country than North Korea. Anyway, I better uh, Okay, with this uh, uh, kind of message of cooperation instead of Confrontation, I would like to thank uh, Sikh Jackson.